Well, happy Sabbath. We're going to begin with our song service this morning. If you'll join me in singing the hymn, Holy, 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 which is number 73, if you're following along in your hymn book. Also projected above behind me, we'll sing all four verses to Holy,
invite Sister Judy to come up to give our guest welcome. Well, good morning, church family and visitors. Wishing you a wonderful, happy Sabbath today. I wish I could come around and give you little goodies like we normally would, but these days things are a little different. But um, soon it will turn back to normal again, I'm praying, we're all praying. But I just wish you a happy Sabbath, we're welcoming our visitors. We have some visitors over here, and um, we have a visitor in the back, or a couple of visitors in the back, I think I've been here several times now. Alan, I know Alan. And uh, we just welcome you, and just wishing you a wonderful and blessed Sabbath today, and come back and visit us again. Um, we will be, you know, continuing our practice of visiting, welcoming our visitors every Sabbath and wishing you come back again and have a great day. Take care. Thank you, Judy. Good morning, everyone. Hope all is well. Want to share some uh, announcements uh, with you. And if you can look on the screen. Unfortunately, our live stream, something burnt out over there. It's our, our live stream. I don't know if you said that already, Rose, but okay. But our live stream is not working, but uh, it'll still be recorded, I'm told, and, um, and then it'll be uploaded. Ish, can you turn that computer so I can see the screen, please? Thank you so much. Okay, so some uh, news items here. Um, now, because our live stream doesn't work, this is actually a moot point. <laughs> but I think people will probably still be texting me anyways. And um, by the way, uh, how many of you have ever visited our church website? Good. Have you just browsed to it? And you can give online and all kinds of cool things on there. Uh, today's offerings are for Thunderbird Adventist Academy. That's our high school out in Scottsdale. And it's a good school. And uh, so that's where our offerings are going for. If you want your offerings to re remain here for our local budget, then what you need to do is, right now, fill out your check or put your cash in a time envelope and mark the amount under local church budget or another ministry here locally that you'd like to give to. Otherwise, um, any loose cash change that, are, are, that you will put in the plates at the end, they're going to go for Thunderbird Adventist Academy. Good school, doing great things over there. And uh, we are asking people to wear their mask unless you're like close family, of course. Um, we heard uh, Kathy's uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so we appreciate if you wear your masks. Thank you so much. And uh, this, uh, this Zoom gathering today, I was just texted uh, by Denise, our Women's Ministries Director. It's been canceled, so there will be no Zoom gathering today at 3 o'clock p.m. And uh, our Sabbath school class is Zoom every uh, Sabbath morning, as you have seen. And of course, our Tuesday night Zoom continues. And uh, we'd love for you to join us for Tuesday night. You don't even have to drive out here. How convenient is that? <laughs> you don't have to come out and drive. All you have to do is stay in the comfort of your own home. And there's the ID. This information is also on our church website. And join us for our Tuesday night class via Zoom. We have good discussions, very, very good discussions. And in fact, do me a favor, grab me that book, Ishmael, please. This is my nephew, Ishmael. Say hello, Ishmael. He's growing, isn't he? So we're going over this book on Tuesday nights. And um, it's just uh, this last Tuesday, it was um, uh, convicting because of the things that we're reading about our health. And so if you really want to be informed and transformed by the Holy Spirit regarding our health, you got to pick up this book and join us on Tuesdays for free. We're going to it away for free, but join us on Tuesday nights and uh, just very good discussions. All right, these rooms, the uh, latest information I have, they're, they're still needed. Uh, call me for details if you can provide a room for this young Adventist man and also for a uh, young woman, a Christian woman. You're going to be studying here at ASU. Um, Paul LeBlanc's here if you want some information regarding them. And today we're starting the new uh, sermon series for the next number of weeks um, called With the Holy Spirit and with Fire. And um, I think you're going to enjoy this. How many of you are just 
eager to know more about the Holy Spirit, what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, and particularly the Holy Spirit's role in the closing days of our little tiny planet. What's his role? What's going to be happening? Um, how is the Holy Spirit going to be affecting people? Um, uh, these things we're going to go over. And as you can see, you have your study guide. If you did not get a study guide, there, there should be, there's still some in the lobby. But you should have a study guide for this morning. So we're going to have study guides for each of the presentations. And in case you missed this announcement last week, our dear sister Joyce Huff is now resting in Jesus. And um, feel free to call her husband, Don, and, you know, just uh, offer your condolences, offer a word of prayer over the phone, and I, I know he will uh, very much appreciate that. I want to mention this before I forget. Um, I received a text this morning from Susan Skelton. Susan and Luke, they're the head honchos at Good News TV in Scottsdale. Many of you watch Good News TV, great programming. Susan Skelton informed me that our Arizona Conference President, Ed Keyes, um, his uh, biopsy returned and he is diagnosed with an aggressive form of melanoma. He's actually going to go to surgery this Thursday. There's danger of major facial nerve damage. And so please, um, I didn't want to forget this and hold it off until the prayer time. I just jotted it here. So let's be praying for our uh, very own dearly beloved Ed Keyes, our, our conference president. Keep him in prayer. And along with that, I mentioned Don Huff and his family, Betty Hopper, the Downey family. Uh, Helen Downey recently passed uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then, of course, Denise McNally is also asking for prayer, um, our dear sister Denise McNally. So keep uh, those individuals in prayer, if you would. Okay, uh, the next thing we have is children's story. And uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll start our children's story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this new Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for the newness of your mercies, because your word says that they are new every morning, every morning. So we thank you, Lord, for your mercies for today, and then we'll receive new ones tomorrow. We pray that you will bless our worship service today, Lord, especially where this imperfect servant of yours talks about you, O Holy Spirit, so bless me, please. And we pray that all that we do and sing and pray and say and our thoughts will be acceptable to you, and we offer this worship service to you, Lord Jesus, as our humble gift to you. We ask that you uh, will inspire us and move us this morning. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Everyone said amen. Okay, our children's story. We're not asking the kids to come down, but Chris, Uncle Chris has our children's story for today. Uncle Chris. Right, good morning, boys and girls. How are you this morning? Okay, I'd like to... Um, Give an illustration today, our theme for today and beginning onward is the Holy Spirit. So I could talk about that a little bit, but uh, what do I have in my hand? What do you, uh, what do you see? That's a flashlight, right? Okay, so what does a flashlight do? What, what do we use it for? What benefits does a flashlight provide? Provides light if it's dark, okay? What instances would we use it? Maybe if the power goes out, if we're out camping and it's nighttime and we need, need to see where we're going, okay, we, we would use the flashlight for that. All right, that was kind of bright in here, but let's uh, turn on the Ooh. Edgar, can we turn off the uh, platform lights real quick? Or from here, we'll turn off the lights and so we'll, uh, we'll see the flashlight. Okay. All right, okay, let's, uh, let's turn this thing on. Uh oh, it's not working. Can anyone know why this wouldn't work? Batteries. Hmm. No, oh, there's no batteries in here. Okay, well, hmm, which, is, which way does it go? That way? Oh, my God, yes. Hold on. I didn't think to remember. 
potential which made the batteries go in the acceptor. Yay! All right, we have light. Okay, so the batteries made a difference. Uh, so this flashlight and the batteries serves as a good illustration of the Holy Spirit. Um, in uh, the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, I think it's verse 17, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, but we need the Holy Spirit inside of us for our light to shine. So just as the flashlight didn't shine uh, without the batteries, uh, we can't really shine without the Holy Spirit. But if we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can shine um, through our, our good works. Now in the Bible, there are several stories with children in which their lights shone. Um, the story I'd like to mention this morning is about a young girl who was from Israel, but she was taken captive by the Syrians. Doesn't mention her name, um, but it mentions that um, her captives were uh, the the guy was the captain of the army of the Syrians, and she attended to his wife. Well, anyway, one day the guy got sick with leprosy. And if you know at least how the Israelites treated leprosy, it was pretty bad. So anyway, she knew, though, that there was a prophet of God in Israel, and so she kept telling her, her uh, the lady that she attended, oh, if only our master would go to Israel and meet the prophet in Israel, he would be healed. So long story short, he got sent by his king to Israel, met Elisha the prophet, and was healed by the Lord of his leprosy. Um, and so this little girl, even though she was taken captive, uh, she told about the Lord and the prophet in Israel, and she let her light shine. It was a good deed that she did that let her light shine. And so for all of us today, for the, for the children, um, we can let our light shine in many different ways, whether it's acts of kindness or um, you know, following the instructions that our parents give us, many different ways. And I actually invite the children to be creative and to think of ways that you can do good things to others. And God will richly bless you for that. The Holy Spirit will live in you to shine for others. And maybe a homework assignment I can give you for this afternoon is to try to think of other stories in the Bible where children play a prominent role in the story. Off the top of my head this morning, I could think of five. I'm sure I didn't think of all of them. But that's your homework assignment. I told you one. See if you can find the others. Let's pray. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would fill our lives with the Holy Spirit so that we can shine for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sure. Okay, we'll do scripture reading now. Eve is going to come up and, and share for us. The scripture reading is in John 14, 20, 26 and 27, which is the counter which is in the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart not let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Thank you, Rita. And I think because of our live stream broken down, we're not getting uh, some texts coming in. But I just I do have one text, and that's from uh, uh, Joey Guzman. He's uh, saying, Happy Sabbath to all our... Now I'm getting the text. There's another one. <laughs> Happy Sabbath to all our church family. And he thanks the Lord for all... Uh, thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. Joey, Lydia, and Anseli. And I don't see him this morning, and so they text that in. They wanted to share this with the church family, how thankful they are. And um, and then also, there's another prayer request to pray for uh, Kathy Hudson, pray for her mom's house, that it, it would 
the cell amid the pandemic, and she thanks God for his faithfulness or and for relief from this financial strain. Thank God for that. How many of you got your stimulus check some weeks ago? How many of you are still waiting for your stimulus check? Okay, there's one, a couple of people maybe. And, um, oh, the house sold, actually. Um, so she thanks God that it did sell during this pandemic. So, yes, yeah, so that's good news. Praise the Lord, yes. And, um, all right, so I'm going to have Chris come on up here. I shared what was on my phone. And, Chris, if you can lead out more praises and, and, um, and requests. I, mean, I was just trying to text Pastor, but then he told me to sum up. So, um, but anyway, I, I mentioned before that uh, my roommate Mason was um, attempting to sell our house. That did sell. So we have two weeks to find two months. Sorry, two months to find a new place. So please pray that God will guide us to give us vision on, on where to go next. Well, I haven't moved in nine years, so it's a big, big deal. All right. Does anyone have any uh, praises or prayer requests, Judy? I want to second what the pastor was saying about uh, prayer meeting and our Zoom meeting on, on Tuesday nights. It's excellent. We, it's, it, it makes our whole week. <laughs> but it has been convicting. And I also have a prayer request for our granddaughter, Samantha. Continue to keep her in prayer. Uh, she's being um, uh, referred to a neurologist at the Phoenix Children's Hospital for some issues that she's been having. So it's a deep in prayer. Anyone else? Any praises or prayer requests you'd like to share? Yes, go ahead. He had a surgery this week because he had a great clear throat and that he can see when I clear. Okay. And he had surgery Tuesday. Today he did so well. Yeah. And I said I'm praised. We praise the Lord for Ron's good surgery that we had this week. Very successful. Good. Anyone else who you'd like to share? <clears throat> That's right. Well, I praise the Lord for Ishmael. My deputy's here today. I know he's embarrassed because I'm saying this, but I praise the Lord because he's with us. And also, um, I praise the Lord because this past week, um, I received some information from a mother in Michigan who had her son in the hospital. Uh, long story short, um, he is a homeless young man. He's not now anymore, but he was. He collapsed because of dehydration. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of details, but I was able to contact him via his mother, which is of the hospital. And this is what he said. He said, Do you think somebody can tell me that when I collapsed, I left all of my things, my electronics, my cell phone, my ID, my license, everything. And I said, Well, it was on the field. Nothing there, and lo and behold, I went out there and everything was there. So I took it to him, I took it to the hospital, it was in the behavioral center, and uh, I just praise the Lord that God looked over those things for me. It was amazing. And I told him, Well, good things are not going to be there, and everything was there. Praise the Lord. All right, anyone else? Praise, praise or prayer requests? Okay, if not, um, let's go ahead and kneel then. Um, if you're able to kneel where you are, and we'll pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your provision for us. You know, the Bible says that you watch out for us, um, that we are in the palms of your hands, and that we are very dear to you. Thank you for that. Um, I want to thank you for... Um, the praises and the answered prayer um, that were mentioned, for example, Ron's successful eye surgery and his uh, recovery that's going very well so far. We thank you so much for that. And the story where Pastor mentioned um, where uh, this uh, man's belongings were uh, all together and not stolen. That, that, that uh, Pastor was able to help him return those. We thank you for that. Um, we pray for those that um, are sick. Um, those that have mentioned some um, health issues. And of course, the world is in so much turmoil. Um, we all have stresses and challenges that we go through, whether it's uh, relationships with family or with people we associate with, uh, whether it's financial, um, 
we know life is difficult, but we know that whatever the difficult circumstances are, that you are with us and that you love us no matter what. Uh, we praise you for uh, the conference president, Elder, Elder Ed Keyes, and his uh, upcoming uh, surgery that he has this week. Uh, it's very unfortunate that he has this um, uh, severe illness, and we just pray that you would watch over him. We pray to you for um, the sermon series and Pastor Ray's to speak on the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we're so thankful for your promise that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, the Father will give the Holy Spirit to us. And so we make that request this morning, and we thank you for hearing our prayers and for answering. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. texting up on the platform here. I was just looking to see if there were more uh, prayer requests and we didn't want to forget any. Okay, does everybody have that study guide? Everybody have a study guide? If you didn't, raise your hand please. If you did not get one. Okay, it looks like Jerry. Okay, that Raul. Uh, uh, looks like Barb was getting one for you, Raul. So, thank you. Okay, now you're going to need some something to write with, and I'm looking for our Deacon Chris, Chris Keller. Chris, can you, are those pencils back there in the Deacon's room, those little golf pencils? They were in your office. Oh, you know what, there's some in the copy room on top of the metal filing cabinets. They're in a little box, so if you can get those for those who don't have anything, anything to write with. All right, times like these. What do you think about our times today? Distressing, I mean, just so many things are happening. Uncertainty, confusion, stress. People are getting stressed out, anxiety. Polarization, did you, you sense those things, everybody? There's more polarization nowadays. Uh, you know, right versus left. Um, destruction, unrest. You know, in the social world, it feels as if, to me anyways, it feels as if, uh, not all the time, but civility and respect and courtesy um, and just propriety are becoming unraveled, um, in, in, in socially speaking. The economic fallout around the world because of COVID-19 is disastrous, especially in our interconnectedness as a globe, as a society. Um, the World Economic Forum said back in April these words, the shock to the global economy from COVID-19 has been both faster and more severe than the 2008 global financial crisis and even the Great Depression. Did you hear that? But this is even worse. That's what they say. Mother Nature has ravaged the world with fires. Maybe you saw those fires on television from in Australia. Um, you know, you see those kangaroos and koalas, you know, with burnt paws, and I mean, it's just heartbreaking. People, loss of property and even of lives, but floods, heat waves in Europe. I think in 2018 and 2019, there were record heat waves in Europe. Uh, as, and of course, Germany, especially in Germany. But be, and besides COVID-19, there's an other plague. Did you hear about this other plague that's hitting East Africa? Locusts, locusts in East Africa, uh, in the countries of South Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda. I saw a statistic, and the statistic said that 15,500 miles. 
of cropland and pastureland are being devastated in those countries I just mentioned. This statistic, this website that I saw said that the locusts are in, and this is not an exaggeration, the locusts are in the hundreds of billions. That's what it said. And all of these locusts have come, they laid their eggs, the eggs are hatching, and they're expecting this second wave of locusts to be even worse than the first one. It's crazy. So all this stuff can be pretty scary. Jesus said something very astute describing the earthly conditions before he returns. I don't know if I have this on the slide. He says this, men faint, in fact, we just read this in my Sabbath school class, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. Men fainting from fear means they're so scared and they're so apprehensive of all the bad things that are going to be happening on planet Earth that they just... They don't know what to do. They get stressed out and people panic and get paranoid and, and do. I always tell my family, you know what? Desperate people do desperate things in desperate situations. <laughs> that's always felt true. But that's what Jesus said. Let me ask you this. Is there fear today in our world because of all that is happening? Is there a lot of fear in our world? I think there is. I think there is. In fact, the more you inform yourself of things that are happening, not just in America, we tend to be so, you know, limited and constrained and you know, knowing what's happening in our country. Things that are happening around the world, the more you see this stuff like, wow, I didn't realize how bad it was. And it's very easy for people to lose faith and hope when things around us look so bleak. But the Bible gives us the assurance that we're not alone. What did you say? The Bible gives us the assurance that we're not alone. Jesus told his disciples that even though he would return to heaven, he wouldn't leave them alone. He wouldn't leave those disciples alone that he was talking to, and he wouldn't leave future disciples in future generations. He would not leave them alone. This is what he said. Look on the screen. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's what Jesus said. Amen? I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to come to you. And in that passage, in that context, he was referring to the Holy Spirit. He was referring to the Holy Spirit that would bring himself to the hearts of every believer on the planet. Just two verses earlier, this is what Jesus said. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. This is his assurance, that he's going to give his Holy Spirit to the world, to people who believe in him. And that's why he said just a, a verse later um, that I will come to you. I won't leave you alone as orphans. The book of Revelation. Anybody ever read the entire book of Revelation? Anybody read the Revelation? How many of you read it more than twice? Three times? 25 times? <laughs> 144,000 times? <laughs> The book of Revelation is actually a letter, a letter intended to be sent to seven churches in Asia Minor. And those seven churches are described in chapters 2 and 3 of the book with unique messages for each church. And at the end of every one of those messages to those churches are these words. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches after every church. The Bible says that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to the churches, is speaking to believers. And after all the conflict between good and evil and the world of evil that the prophet John had seen in vision that would take place after his time and our time and even in our near future, you would think that after seeing all of these things, John would collapse because of all of the gloom and doom and all of the darkness and the things that are going to be transpiring and the conflict between good and evil and how all of that plays out. Uh, if I were to see all of those things in vision, I would say, Lord, stop it now. I've had enough. Give me something good. 
And then he sees a vision of a beautiful city called Jerusalem that God had designed for his people. I would just think that John would probably say, now that's what I needed. I need something positive. After so much calamity, that brought hope. And it was the Holy Spirit who took him there. Listen to what the Bible says. And he carried me away in what? In the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that took him, gave him a vision of the future, to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. The Holy Spirit took him there. And it is the Holy Spirit that makes the invitation for all people today to have that same hope and to look forward to the future. This is what it says. The Spirit and the bride say come. The Spirit says come. The Holy Spirit is inviting all people to say come. We want you to come to this Jerusalem. So let's take a break from calamity and bleak news and forecasts and focus on the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's focus on the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit says, what the Holy Spirit can do for us today. So in this series of the Holy Spirit, our focus is a renewed spiritual and moral energy and power in life by knowing who the Holy Spirit is and being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to do in these next few weeks. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 1. In him you also... After listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with what? The Holy Spirit. You are sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, his pledge of you, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So everyone who has received the Holy Spirit, Paul is telling the Ephesians, this is a guarantee. This, this is a guarantee of your inheritance. You have the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I will bring you the Holy Spirit. I will be with you through the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, this is a guarantee of your inheritance. What is the inheritance? I just read it a few verses ago. What is our inheritance? Jerusalem. This beautiful, good morning, this beautiful new city called Jerusalem on the new planet that God is going to recreate. If we have the Holy Spirit, it is a guarantee. This is your ticket to that new Jerusalem. It is your ticket to heaven. It is your ticket to the new world. Having the Holy Spirit. That's good news. And Paul said that if anyone has the Holy Spirit, that he or she belongs to Jesus Christ. That's in Romans chapter 8. Anyone who is being led by the Spirit are children of God. So these next few weeks, we're going to be studying about the Holy Spirit. Again, with a focus on the Holy Spirit's involvement with our salvation and how that all works out and his end time special ministry for God's people. So we're going to look at things. Uh, you probably heard these phrases before. Early rain and latter rain. Ever hear those terms before? We're going to look at early rain and latter rain. We're going to look at how the Holy Spirit works in us. And we're actually going to look at some uncomfortable, sometimes confusing things that we need to clarify. And I don't have all of the answers, but I'm going to do my best. We're going to look at perfectionism. Perfection versus perfectionism through the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit make us absolutely perfect people before Jesus comes? Or will we, will we, or will we still have certain challenges and, and the fights against the old self? We're going to look at that and how the Holy Spirit plays out in those things. So first of all, for this morning, again, everybody has the guide, right? Everybody has this guide? Okay, got the guide? We're going to look at, first of all, very, very importantly, who the Holy Spirit is. We need to understand who the Holy Spirit is. So I'm going to just jump the gun, and I'm going to direct your minds to the very back. Because when we talk about the Holy Spirit, um, and some of the things we're going to read in here, um, you're going to need to understand that from our perspective, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we believe in what is called 
the Godhead, or the triune God, tri means three, or the Trinity, T-R-I, Trinity means three. So I am going to be teaching throughout, especially this morning, this is going to be the first thing, I'm going to be teaching that the Holy Spirit is actually God, is actually God. So if you read this on the back, this does this topic no justice about the Trinity. This little tiny thing that I put there does it no justice, but it just gives you a little glimpse into the challenges that the early Christians, they call them the church fathers. They weren't fathers in the sense of like a Catholic father or a priest. They just called them the church fathers. For the first 300 years, there were some big names, big church leaders, and they called them, from our vantage point, they called them the fathers. And they wrestled with this. And uh, so you want to read that a little bit. So I just want to state that from the get-go that this series is about the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Godhead or the Trinity. So we're going to look at who the Holy Spirit is. And if you have Bibles with you, I know we have few Bibles. So, uh, you know, I know we're trying to touch the least things possible because of the virus. And so if you want to grab that Bible, great. But I'm going to be reading some verses. I'm going to be jumping back and forth. We're not going to cover all the verses here, but I will read them for you in my Bible. So look at the top. You need something to write with because there's a few blanks, and I'll have them here on the screen. There's a few blanks to fill in. The top says, although no one can fully comprehend the nature of the Holy Spirit, the Bible gives us enough information to understand at least two points. If you were to read everything that the Bible says about the Holy Spirit or Spirit in the Old and New Testament, you're going to have a lot of information. And then you have to just sort of synchronize, bring that information together, and make do with it, and figure out what does the Bible teach about the Holy Spirit. We're not the only ones. That's what I mentioned earlier. Those early church fathers did it. They wrestled with it. And um, in 325 A.D., there was a big church meeting that took place. The very first, other than Acts chapter 15, the very first church council to deal with issues and disagreements and theological stuff is described in Acts 15. But after that, that was the first century, after that, they were having some disagreements and things were being taught in the Christian churches. And some people agreed with that theology, others strongly disagreed. And one of them was this idea of Trinity. Is there a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Is Jesus not God, but is Jesus just another created being by God? Well, this came to a head. This came to a standstill. And in the year 325 AD, it was called the Church Council at Nicaea which was in Asia, Mi Asia Minor back then. Right now it's modern Turkey. And everybody converged for a few days from May to August. And out of that council is where we get the doctrine of the Trinity. It's in the back of your, it's in the back of your lesson. That's where we get the doctrine of the Trinity from. There are some people that still disagree with that, the Trinity. Our, the Seventh-day Adventist Church does not disagree with that. We hold this to be true that we agree with this doctrine. And uh, it's in more detail in some of our publications. So, there's still some things that are maybe hard to understand about the Holy Spirit. We can understand at least two things. Now, get your writing instruments out. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. That's what you, that's what you want to write in your uh, study guide. The Holy Spirit is a person. And then the second one is that the Holy Spirit is deity equal in divinity with the Father and the Son. Those two major points. The Holy Spirit is not some active force, una fuerza activa. It's not just an active force like electricity or a whirlwind or a hurricane. It is, or I should say, not just to get it. The Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit is deity. So let's look at, first of all, the Holy Spirit as a person. Now, if you look in your guide there, you'll see those orange bold titles, intellect, emotions, and will. And you see all of those verses there. We're not going to go to all of those verses, but you can check these verses out on your own when you go home, okay? So I'm just going to refer to a few of them. 
Um, I'm going to go to Luke chapter 12 and verse 12. Luke chapter 12 and verse 12. And this is what the Bible says. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, if I'm a teacher and you're the student, what are some of the prerequisites I need to be a teacher? And I'm just talking in general terms, not necessarily spiritual. What, 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 what? Chris? I need education. I need to be in the know, right? I need to know things. But before I have education, what do I need? This isn't a trick question. I'm just like going, I'm using logical reasoning going back and back. So if I need, if I need an education to be a teacher, before I get an education, what do I need? Ambition. I need a desire, open-mindedness. So let me give you a clue. If I need to be educated, what do I need? I need a brain, right? I need a brain. I need a mind to think with. And then of course I need a voice to speak with and you know to uh, you know to understand and to reason. I need a brain. Well, if the Holy Spirit, it says here, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And the context is some people may be worried, some Christians, well, you know, if I'm arrested and if there's persecution. And uh, everybody is just bombarding me with questions, and, and I don't know what to say. And you know, how do I defend my belief and my faith and what I, you know, what I believe in? How do I talk about Jesus and etc. 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 Jesus says, you know, don't worry, be happy. He says because the Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit is going to bring to your mind concepts and thoughts. And you will verbalize those things and you're going, whoa, where did that come from? I actually said that. How many of you have ever been surprised if you're talking to somebody about Christ or you're doing a Bible study or it's a serious conversation about spiritual things and you will say something and later you thought, man, that was, I feel pretty good about myself. Maybe God really helped me to say those things. Ever feel like that before? Ever had those experiences? They're amazing experiences when you when you sense that, when you feel that. It's amazing. Because you feel like the Holy Spirit was using me. God was using me. And I said things that I was even surprised at myself. I said, I've talked to people and I've used illustrations to try and illustrate a, a deep spiritual truth. And after that conversation or that Bible study, I'm thinking. You know, I feel pretty good. Wow, that was cool. I didn't even think of that illustration. It just came out. You ever feel that way before? I have. Because the Lord, the Holy Spirit, gives you those things to say. And so that is a strong indicator of his intellect. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is another one. Is another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And this is what it says there. It's in your guide in verse... Uh, verses 11 through 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I love this passage. I've always liked this one. Verse 11 says, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Don't get confused. It doesn't mean the Holy Spirit in that sense. It just means the spirit of man. In other words, your, the realm of your thoughts, of your intellect. Well, who knows your own thoughts except you, right? I can't read your mind. So you know your own thoughts. That's his point. Even so, the thoughts of God... No one knows except whom? The Spirit of God. Well, you have to have intellect. And in this case, divine intellect, divine smarts, eternal smarts. That is way beyond our comprehension. The Holy Spirit knows perfectly what's on God's mind. You know what the Bible says in Isaiah about our thoughts in comparison to God's thoughts? You know what it says? God's thoughts are way higher than our thoughts. And then Isaiah says, as the heavens, as the sky and outer space, as they are higher than the soil, so my thoughts are way higher than your thoughts, God says. And who knows those thoughts perfectly? The Bible says here, the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. You want to know what is on God's mind and how he views things and his perceptions and what he feels about things? Then you pray. Holy Spirit, help me to understand 
Help me to understand what God says in His Word. That's what the Bible says, intellect. Let's go to emotions. Ephesians chapter 4 is just a couple of books over if you have your Bibles open. You have Galatians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. Um, this one, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. So let me, let me illustrate it this way. I'm driving down. I went to Tucson this past week uh, with John Baker. We went to Tucson and we were coming back. <laughs> John saw a dust storm, right, John? <laughs> I'm glad you didn't wake me up to see that as I told you. But, you know, if you drive from here to Tucson and back, you'll always see those little whirly things, those little dust storms. You'll see little ones and bigger ones, etc. Now, if there is a dust storm, and if I were able to go through that dust storm, you know, it's kicking up dust and it's there, you can physically see it. If I were able to go there and just, like, break it up, I don't know what gigantic hose or a big giant knife and I were to just cut it off do you think that dust will get angry with me and start crying yes or no, no. is the dust going to be oh my God. why did you cut me off I was having fun impersonal Entities don't have emotions. But look at what Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says. The Bible says this, Ephesians 4, 30. Do not, what? Grieve. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Remember that other verse about sealing and inheritance, etc.? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. What does grieve mean? It means sorrowful, to be saddened, to be saddened, right? When Ishmael doesn't do the chores I tell him to, I'm grieved. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a person, that's what we're talking about, a person, and the Holy Spirit can actually be saddened by your and my actions, if they're the wrong actions. The Holy Spirit can actually be saddened. It's emotional. Feel it. The Holy Spirit feels it. And then, of course, there's will. Look at the next one where it says activities, that black bolt. Activities indicate personality. The Holy Spirit hears. In John 16, 13, the Holy Spirit speaks. And let's look at John 16, 8. John 16, 8. This is uh, the, some of the things that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. This is, uh, indicates personality, he it convicts. John 16 and verse 8. The Bible says here, John 16, verse 8, and he, when he comes, this is reference to the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. <clears throat> so if you do something wrong, if you do something wrong, let's say you bring in a spray can and you start putting graffiti on these beautiful stained glass windows. Look at these stained glass windows. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. And if you start putting graffiti on them, right? And I come to you and I say, you know, this is really bad. And I speak to you kindly and I say, you know, you're going to have to pay for this. And, and I speak in a way that makes you feel bad about what you did. I'm bringing conviction to your heart. Because the way that I do it about it, I just say, oh, you idiot, oh, get out of here. So why did you do this? You know, what made you do this? You know, this is God's house. And I start speaking in a kind, in a loving way, and trying to woo you so that your own conscience will be pricked. And that happens. You begin to feel convicted of what you did, right? It's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. This is an indication not of some whirlwind, some inactive electricity or force. The Holy Spirit can actually bring thoughts to your hand. That's why we feel guilty. Sometimes that's why we feel shameful. Because it's God's Spirit making you feel that way. He brings conviction of our sins. And it's the Holy Spirit, like I said, with tact and with wooing and with love, tries to talk to us. Say it the right way. It's not the road you want to go down with. This isn't the person you should be with. Tries to bring conviction. Does it always work? Well, 
his part, he always does that. But we don't always lend him a listening ear, do we? <laughs> Unfortunately. And that's where the grieving takes place in Ephesians 4.30. That's what makes the Holy Spirit grieve. But just think about it. When we're convicted of our sins and we're being wooed by the Holy Spirit and we ask Jesus Christ, forgive me, Jesus, how do you think the Holy Spirit feels at that point? You listen. She listened to me. Yes. <laughs> you did a good job. This is what God had designed purposefully. Our consciences. It's that area of our existence where the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And it's a dangerous thing. Let me share a quick story with you. We'll have to go on to the section two. The Holy Spirit is busy. I want you to pastor to give this illustration. I don't know if it was a true story or not. But it made a good point. There was this man that had a little puppy dog. And this little puppy was all <laughs> like my Cooper does at home. Just always barking <laughs> at the wrong time. You ever have a dog that always barks at the wrong time at two in the morning? <laughs> Don't you hate that? <laughs> or at you know at five in the morning? <laughs> and this uh, this guy just got rolled up a newspaper magazine, bam, just hit it on the head. And every time that little puppy would bam, it just hit it on the head. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And that's how this poor puppy grew up. And it grew up, it was old, and when the puppy wanted to bark at something, it would open its mouth, but what do you think happened? No sound came out. No sound came out. Because it was that condition to just not make any noise. And he said, that's kind of like the way it is with us and the Holy Spirit. If we continue to shut out the Spirit's voice, in our consciences, and it's on a continual basis. Pretty soon the Holy Spirit's going to do this. You won't be able to hear God's voice anymore. It's shut up. You've been smacking the Holy Spirit for so long, it's not, no, nothing's going to come out of His mouth. Unfortunately. Look at that quote in, the, in that quote box. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these realms. You know why I know this is true? Because the power of God's word and the things that I'm saying to you, you are being convicted right now. I can tell. I've grown these ability to look at people's eyes and know the message is getting through. I can tell. Not to everybody, but I can tell. That's not me. It's the Holy Spirit working through his word. Just make that clear. It's not me doing that. It's the Holy Spirit. So that's why I know the Holy Spirit is right now as I speak, right here present with us. Let's go to section number two. The Holy Spirit is deity. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says this. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, to cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. So the Bible says here that how much will Christ through his eternal spirit, there it is, this Holy Spirit is eternal, which means the Spirit has never had a beginning, and the Holy Spirit will never have an end. By the way, I'm going to take a, just a quick commercial and 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 read this first paragraph on the back side because think about it the bible says in chapter in first john chapter 4 verse 8 that god is god is love come on guys say it with me god is love the bible says god is love is god is love centered on the self or centered upon others Love by its very nature is outward focused. So if a married couple, if the woman, the wife, is always doing only what she wants to do, and if the husband is only doing what she wants to do, would you say there's authentic love in that relationship? But what if both of them are in competition with each other? And the wife wants to do things that will please her husband. And the husband wants to do things that will please his wife. Would you say that's a good competition? That's good. If you are alone, completely alone, 
You uh, have no access to anybody. You are alone. You live up in the mountains. You don't talk. You're just alone. No, no devices. No connectivity. You're alone. Can you authentically practice love? Can you? Can you? When you're alone, cut off from people. You cannot. Because love, by its very nature, is active and does things for others. Love is unselfish. It's other-focused. And so one of the, I believe, one of the most powerful arguments in favor of a trinity is that if God, the Father, is completely alone, and there is no Holy Spirit as a co-eternal person, or there is no Son of God as a co-eternal person, how can you actually be loved? How can God really be loved if he's alone? That's why in the book of Genesis, let us make man in our image. Let us, in Genesis chapter 11, when the Tower of Babylon was being built, let us go down and check this thing out. Let us. In fact, the uh, Elohim, that Hebrew word in Genesis, is the plural form of God. Did you know that? It's the plural form of God. Interesting. In fact, in John chapter 1 and verse 1, what does John 1 1 say? I'm testing your knowledge here. Don't disappoint me. <laughs> what does John 1 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on in that chapter, the Word was Jesus Christ. Interesting. Very fascinating. So the Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent. That means all-powerful. Omnipotent. There's a lot of verses there. The Holy Spirit is omniscient on the bottom of that, that side. He shares the Father's thoughts, teaches all things. We saw that earlier. Gives messages to the prophets. Gives messages to the prophets. Now think about it this way. We're talking about who the Holy Spirit is for this morning before we delve into the other stuff. Think about this. How does God talk to the prophets here in the Bible? Everything the prophets wrote and spoke. How did God do it? It was through the Spirit. The Bible says that holy men of God were moved by whom? The Holy Spirit. They spoke because of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the Father saying, Spirit, go down there and share my thoughts. Remember what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1? The Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. They're in cahoots. They know exactly. They're in perfect harmony. It is the Holy Spirit who moved upon these men who wrote the Bible. It was through the Spirit. The Spirit was speaking to them. The Spirit was inspiring them. The Spirit knows everything. And of course, on the very top of the page, I've got to read this one. Um, I like what David says here in Psalm 139 and verses 7 through 12. This is what David says. Listen up, 139. David says this. Where can I go from your Spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? It's interesting that he uses... Holy Spirit and the presence of God interchangeably. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is the grave, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, etc., etc. Where can I go? The Holy Spirit is ever present. The, now look at the you see those eyeballs there in your guide. The prefix omni, omnipresent, omniscient, um, uh, what was the other one? Um, omniscient, omni, uh, omnipotent. The prefix omni, uh, omni means all. It means all or the string universal. Those are the two words you fill into those, in those blanks. Omni means all or universal. The Holy Spirit is identified with Yahweh of the Old Testament. And there's the verses there. We'll look at them. The presence of the Father and the Son is through the Spirit. Now this one I do want to read. And this is in Psalm 51 and verse 11. Psalm 51, verse 11. And this is what the uh, King David said. Psalm 51, 
verse 11, the presence of the Father and the Son is via the Holy Spirit. Psalm 51, verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence. So David is talking to God. By the way, Psalm 51, it's an amazing chapter because David is just, he is fessing up. He is exposing his heart himself to God. He's just fessing up and he's owning to his horrid sin that he committed. That's what Psalm 51 is describing. It's not describing the sin itself, but Psalm 51 is David's heart being poured out on paper. Anybody here a songwriter? Oh, wait, songwriter? Anybody? Or uh, you don't have to raise your hand. Maybe you have diaries. In fact, <clears throat> I hope you don't mind if, if I say this. Is, I'm having an issue read the Diary of Anne Frank. Okay? Have you ever read that book, The Diary of Anne Frank? Anne Frank was that little girl who was taken to uh, Birkenau, the concentration camps, the very Nazi Germany train, and she wrote this diary, amazing, and it's a classic read. High school and colleges will require reading of this book. And, um, and Anne Frank, she says that, uh, in fact, I shared some of the things that she said a few weeks back, if you remember. Anne Frank says that she really didn't have a true close friend in her life. Although she was the most popular kid in the class, she didn't really have a true friend. Nobody really knew her. And so that's why she started, started her diary. And she called her diary Kitty because she felt Kitty was really her friend. So Anne Frank, she could really, in private, with no eyes looking, she could really open up with Kitty and write anything she wanted. And now the whole world uh, can read what uh, Anne Frank's thoughts were. And, um, and so the Holy Spirit knows so intimately what God and the Son are about. That same Spirit can reveal to us this intimacy. Look at what the Psalm 11, uh, Psalm 50, uh, 1 verse 11 says. He says, do not cast me away from your presence, that's God, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Because of what he did, David, he was just, please don't abandon me. I'm begging you, forgive me of my sin. I'm begging you, please stay here with me. That's what David was doing in Psalm 51. He was, he's begging God, don't leave me. And if God were to leave him, God will withdraw his spirit because that's the way God, Jesus Christ, is present in our hearts. It's through the spirit. So David is just bleeding. He feels horrible about himself. He just shoot himself. That's how bad he felt. Of course, he didn't. He didn't commit suicide, but that's how bad he felt. And look at what that other second box says, that quote box. The comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine what? Grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. The Holy Spirit just brings the grace of Christ into our hearts. Brings that grace of Christ into our hearts. Amazing. And then the last section in the lesson, there's only one God. There's only one God. Uh, the Bible writers were monotheists. You can fill in that blank. The Bible were monotheists. They believed in only in one God. So mono means one, right? As opposed to stereo, there's mono. Some of you out here don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> mono and stereo. Mono means one, a monologue. Ever hear a monologue? When's the last time you heard a monologue? Right now. <laughs> right now, you're hearing a monologue. It means one person is speaking. What's a dialogue? Two people. That's why it's important in our Sabbath school classes, it's not a monologue. In Sabbath school classes, there has to be dialogue, right? But the monotheist, mono meaning one, theist, comes from the Greek word theos, which means what? God. So they believed in only one God, 
Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 35 says, The Lord, he is God. There is no other besides him. That's what the Bible says. There is no other besides him. This is what those, as I said earlier, those early church fathers wrestled with. This is what there was a read the back just to get a little clue. This is what they wrestled with. Well, if there's only one God, then that means Jesus Christ cannot be God. And that's why, um, I forget his name, uh, uh, what's his name? And, uh, Arius. That's why Arius thought, well, when Jesus Christ has to be a created being, being, he's finite. He's not infinite. Jesus is finite. Jesus was created like the other angels. He's still a savior. And others disagree with that. Well, how could that be the things that Jesus said uh, when he forgave people? Only God could forgive people's sins, right? That's why the Jews were so angry at Jesus Christ. Well, who could forgive sins? Why does this fellow speak blasphemy? Who could forgive sins but God alone? Intense. Who do you think Jesus was then? He was God because he could forgive sins. What about texts such as Matthew 1.18? Would you turn there with me? What about Matthew 1.18? How do you, how do you deal with, with this stuff? In Matthew chapter 1.18, it says here, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Point one, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Jesus. Point two, before they came together, in other words, before they were we, uh, they weren't married yet. They were engaged. That's what betrothed means. They were engaged. They weren't married yet, so they didn't have intimate relations with each other yet. So that's what he's saying. When they were betrothed, she was betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, meaning those that intimate relationship, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now, can you explain that to me? So let me ask you a very simple question. Who in this universe has the power to create life from nothing? We read about that in Genesis 1 and 2. God spoke and things existed. God said, let there be mountains and valleys and trees and lakes and, and animals. And it took about a hundred million years for it to progress and come to be, right? No. God has the power to speak, and whatever he speaks, things happen. It happened. So, who was responsible for Mary, the mother of Jesus, becoming pregnant? But I thought you just said only God could create. There was no union between husband and wife. So this conception came out of nothing. It was impossible for Mary to conceive. Impossible. What about in Acts chapter 5 where there's a story in there where um, people are selling. The, there's a lot of poor people in the church. And the Christians there, some of them were, well, many of them, most of them, all of them, were feeling sorry for those who were in need. This is a cool story. So what did they start doing? They started selling their stuff. They had yard sales, they had block yard sales, and, you know, they emptied their garage, and just selling stuff. And then the proceeds they brought to the apostles, and the apostles from there did it and out, you know. Um, uh, you know um, Benjamin and Mary, you need a stimulus check? <laughs> so they would bring the proceeds from those yard sales and they would bring them to people who were in need. And there was this couple that brought money to the apostles. Um, you were generally in Acts chapter 5. There was, the, there was a couple and their names were Ananias and Sapphira, or Sapphira, not Shakira. Not Shakira. <laughs> Ananias and Sapphira, or Sapphira. Of course, in the, they would say Sapphira. We English speakers say Sapphira or something. And so they brought money, but they lied. Because 
the people then, they would take their money and maybe they would keep some of it to themselves and they would say, this is what we're bringing to you. We did keep, you know, 50 bucks uh, for giving this for the poor people because we need to buy some food or whatever. Oh, that's cool. Anybody can do that. That's fine. But Ananias and Sapphira, the, what seems the story to indicate is that they brought the money and they said, this is all of the money that we got. This is all of the money. In other words, we're giving the poor people 100% from our sales. You know, and other people say, they're generous, 100%. You, you, wow, they are, these are generous people. Oh, these all oh, loving people, 100%. 100%. Wow. But they were lying. Because the Bible says they kept some for themselves, but they were crediting themselves. This is all. And that's what the story says. And interestingly, Peter says this, verse 3, chapter 5. Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to whom? It says the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit. And then the very next verse, he says in those last words, you have conceived this deed in your heart. You have not lied to men, but to whom? Ooh, says God there. I thought you were lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying to God. Well, which one? Well, if you take all of these passages in the Bible together, it's because the Holy Spirit is God. So the confusion can be is in what the lesson says, the question says, how can there be only one God and yet a Father a Son, and a Holy Spirit. And that's why I said from the very get-go in your lesson, although no one can fully comprehend the nature of the Holy Spirit, the Bible gives us enough information to understand at least those two major points. The Holy Spirit is person, and the Holy Spirit is deity. Um, there's enough evidence to conclude that the Bible does teach a triune God, a trinity. So this is the Holy Spirit. This is just an introductory introduction. Hang on to your seats because what's coming in the next weeks, we're going to get a little more deeper into the Holy Spirit's activities. But now you have a summary of who the Holy Spirit really is. So to conclude our morning, the lesson, I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to sing this song. I'm going to invite Rose to come on up here. And uh, Beverly is all set to go. And we are going to sing this closing song. that gives us this information 
to transform our lives. And we know that a change of heart, the new birth, the change of character only comes through you, Holy Spirit. And this is what we need for our lives today. Lord, you see with terrible accuracy everything that happens here on planet Earth. And Lord, we as your children can sometimes get lost in focusing what's all around us and take our eyes off of you, just like Peter did when he walked on the waves. Help us, Jesus, to focus on you during these times. And we know that it's because you have you give your spirit to us. So we thank you for your blessing today. Continue to bless us the rest of your Sabbath day. Continue to bless us throughout this week. And then we keep in step, as your servant Paul said, keep in step with the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And I uh, want to remind you that our two, our deacon and our deaconess are at the exit with the offering plates. And this is the time where you can give your offerings. And our deacons will usher you out for a Bible. God bless you. Happy Sabbath.